Hello everyone and welcome to the Story X Story podcast where we discuss stories across pop culture plus give you advice on creating your own. It's episode number 20 for Wednesday the 1st of April. I'm your co-host and Maya Maddox co-founder Nigel. I'm Tazzy, streamer and co-host. And we have a special guest for a uh, special episode we're doing. So we're going to be introducing uh, this like interview series of shows where we talk with other creators specifically about their work and their creative process. Uh, so today we are joined by Makiko. How are you? Hi, I'm very well. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Thanks for joining us in this in this weird weird times that we all <laughs> existing. We're going to get into that uh, in a bit. But um, just to remind listeners, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, um, pretty much wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also send us feedback on this episode and any other episode you might have listened to so far. Feedback at myamada.com or shout at us on social media, uh, Maya Mada on Twitter, at Maya Mada Tees on Instagram, and Tazzy on both. Uh, so we are going to go straight into our guest. This is all about Mikiko today. So I'm not going to talk about Maya Mada stuff. We're not going to talk about stories we've been, actually we might talk about some of the stories we've been watching, but most of it is all about Mikiko. So we're going to get straight into our interview. Um, so today we have with us, as we've said already, um, illustrator and storyteller Makiko, um, who in over 12 years of freelancing has worked in comics, manga, video games and TV. So quite an array uh, here. Uh, so first of all, obviously we are currently living in a very weird time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like, how has the, the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, impacted you and your work as a freelancer um yes well a lot has well a lot has changed but a lot has also not changed <laughs> <laughs> so so like the part that hasn't really changed at all is um you know you probably know that artists generally stay at home a lot and they're just sort of you know in their little room and, and drawing away so that that part really hasn't changed at all so that stereotype um, is true Exactly. Yeah. Saying. So okay. essentially, I'm very, very well equipped to do the self isolation, <laughs> just because, um, you know, my work kind of. I, I don't work in an office, obviously, and uh, my studio at home is just a tiny little room right next to the kitchen. So I've I've really got everything I need. Um, so that that part's unchanged, and I'm I'm quite happy that I've I'm kind of well prepared. Uh, the other part, however, is has become a bit difficult. So I I have an online shop. Um, I also go to co conventions and events and just shows in general quite frequently. Um, so those were unfortunately all cancelled. My shop has been closed very recently because, um, you know, being a freelancer, I, I don't exactly have the money to to uh, employ people. So that the shop was run by my parents who are elderly and um, I couldn't really risk them getting in any danger. So the best thing to do was to close that. Um, so instead of those things so instead of selling books and merchandise i've just decided to uh, uh draw commissions so that's that's working out pretty well i've currently only opened it to my um patreon uh people fans and uh it's it's been going very well so i've been just just drawing at home and and just sort of waiting it out seeing how things develop and yeah you just kind of you kind of just watch it and see how you can adapt to it i suppose at this point don't really know how how the future is gonna look in a couple of weeks so yeah that's my current situation i'm just at home drawing commissions you know uploading whatever i can to to show people i'm still alive <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah that, that, that's it <laughs> yeah i can totally relate there with the not much has changed but also a lot has changed <laughs> um because yeah similar thing I'm at home most of the time anyway but there are reasons that I have to go out and they're all not there so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but yeah so I suppose keeping sane is not a big issue for you then because like you already said you're used to it yeah yeah so it's 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 quite um nice in a way that you like 
some things that you have to do before you simply can't as you said um you know i'd have to go out shopping for food and i don't know bring things to the post office all that's gone so i've actually freed up some extra time so i've noticed that i'm much more productive in this time than usually because i get distracted way more in in normal situations (laughs) so (laughs) maybe yeah in terms of just the volume of art i create i feel like i've I've been doing exceptionally well the past two weeks (laughs) it's a bit of a uh the silver lining in a dark cloud there (laughs) pretty much yeah (laughs) yeah and a lot of netflix i'm finally getting through all of the shows (laughs) Such a great opportunity to catch up on <laughs> anything yeah. you've been missing. <laughs> Netflix, is, Netflix has got to be loving this because yeah. this is all I've been watching. <laughs> <laughs> same, same, yeah. Okay, uh, so yeah, we're going to go on to a few more um, questions that are more uh, specific on your sort of like creative process. Mm-hmm. Um, Nigel, do you want to take it away? Yeah, so uh, I wanted to know just seeing you your uh, work actually before we get into that we can discuss like what you do so uh, as noticed you've got like two main projects so you've got your it's your ongoing web series um, and then you've got your series crash and burn so do you want to tell us about both of those yeah sure so um so these two projects are kind of um uh, how how do I describe this? Um, so I'm known for both of them, but very often the one fan base doesn't know that I create the other one as well because they're so different from one another. So yeah, the... I imagine they are different, completely different audiences. Yeah, they are. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, the Mickey's mini comics is um, what I started to draw. I think seven or eight, maybe ten years ago. I'm not even sure. Um, many many years ago, I started drawing. Uh, small slice of life comic strips about my friends, my family, just general people in my life that just experienced silly moments. So very, very common things. Uh, People read these um, and they just really, really identified with them, even though they were just gifts for friends. They became um, my most popular things uh, back then on DeviantArt actually oh, wow. <laughs> yeah so it's a long time ago and uh, it just became so popular that I really couldn't stop drawing them because people just loved it and so f- at first it was just uh, for, for birthdays for Christmas I just draw people uh, in their funny situations and um, and then later on it became like a web series um, so you didn't even one... intend to do a web series specifically oh, no. <laughs> no not at all that's amazing it was just a complete uh, stroke of luck that people just loved it and I just went with it and it just became bigger and bigger and um, I really realized that it was so popular when I started seeing it everywhere where I didn't post them (laughs) so so Uh Facebook and Instagram and and nine gag and I don't know what they're called there's loads of meme sites that just uh, repost everything so I kept seeing them everywhere and and at first I was like really frustrated as well, but then it dawned on me that it's just so popular that people just want to spread it more and share it more. And and so I stuck with it and that became, um, yeah, the Mickey's mini comics and I actually print, printed, I kickstarted a book. Um, so yeah, volume I saw one, that. Yeah, volume one is like out. It went really well. <laughs> yeah, it did. Unfortunately, I can't give you the link to my shop because my shop is currently yeah. closed. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, you you can read them online on Tapas for free. So the the entire series is on on Tapas currently. Um, yeah, and so so I just I don't know that one is is the one for for everybody. It's all ages. It's very very sort of innocent humor it's it's very straightforward you know with cats and the life as an artist and uh it's in full color as well and it's just very carefree and silly uh, everyone loves cats to be exactly fair. i mean who doesn't right <laughs> um yeah and on the other hand is crash and burn and that is a kind of like a complete different path i took with that so i originally used I used to live in Germany and I I used to be published in Germany and Crash and Burn was my uh, I think my second no my third title in Germany with Tokyo Pop in Germany and they um, in Germany the the genre boys love is incredibly popular so that's uh, yaoi or boys love is just uh, 
guys with guys having sometimes romantic, sometimes a little sexual relationship. So it's kind of like, uh, it's I would say it's not really a, a gay genre because the, the majority of the people who read it are actually straight girls. They just like good looking guys in romantic stories. Um, and when I drew this one, however, I decided that I didn't want it to be stories for girls. I wanted it to be stories for everybody and including LGBT. And so I just uh, wrote a story about two uh, rockers. One is a more a punk rocker. The other one's more into metal and how they are both kind of very much not into these roles in these relationships. So this this boys love genre very very much has like a, a feminine and a masculine role and I just decided I'll just make both masculine and instead of cuddling they'll be shouting at each other and you know <laughs> creating loud music and punching each other and just you know being a bit high strung and like high energy and um and it was a, a huge risk at first because you know nobody everybody was into the romance stuff yeah. but when it came out it actually took off and so in Germany it's it's my most popular title and I have a huge dedicated fan base in Germany and uh yeah and I had some legal um issues for a while and recently so that the whole thing I, I drew it and published it in 2011 to 13 I think and then after yeah, that so we it's had been going some... for a while yeah, yeah. So we had some disagreements and, and eventually after about five years, I, I managed to get some of my rights back. So now I'm publishing the English version um, free online. So you can read the, okay. the whole thing online as well. <laughs> Wait, just to, are you able to shed some light on what those legal issues um, were? Is that... Well, I can't really go into yeah, details, I, guess it I don't might think. Be a... I think it would be a bit unprofessional to to just lay it out, but uh, I I can just say that we, I wasn't quite happy that they they didn't um, f well a huge part of me approaching them to have it published was that they knew that I had a, an international and English speaking fan base, and um, over the years I uh, repeatedly tried to get an English version to become a thing like regardless of how I made many many suggestions on to how we could do it and we just couldn't really see eye to eye on it and nothing ever came of it and okay. essentially by German law I could um, re reclaim unused rights and the English version was unused so this is how I got the right back to doing whatever I want as long as it's in English sure. <laughs> essentially so th that's like the short of it um, so yeah, and I decided the first thing I'm going to do is give give my fans what they asked for, which was they wanted to read it in English, right? And uh, and I don't really believe in, you know, some people are afraid that if you put things out there that people will stop buying it because it's free online already. But my um, my experience was that in fact, because people can read it for free online, you if your material is actually really good, a lot of people are just going to come and read it and then share it with their friends and then share it with their friends and and so on and eventually you just have such a huge fan base that the return through sales is totally worth it yeah yeah that makes sense yeah and i think that's something i've had to learn kind of the hard way with in terms of like <laughs> when we started my mad we sort of our thought was like to make books and then books we would then sell at events online wherever um but sort of forgetting that the, the audience building part of it and it helps when you have that free content out to so people get to know you uh what you create your characters your stories so then when you do something like you mentioned you uh ran the, the kickstarter uh, for your mini comics people are really familiar with the content mm -hmm. and then more likely to want to back something that yeah. you do that's right it's it's really amazing because i also started to offer um so ebook versions and you would think that well you've got all your comics online as a web comic to read for free why would anybody buy an ebook right but it's it's insane i make um like i i sell so many ebooks to people because a huge part of the people who want to support me are uncomfortable with like for example patreon some people don't like the subscription model then sure. some people some people can't pay the postage you know um, but they want to support me or something, or they want to have a version that they can share with their friends or read on their tablet. It's just so many reasons. Like even the printed 
version. Some people are just huge fans. They just want it signed or they want to gift it to somebody. So there's many, many reasons and excuses to to sort of support an artist. And I think um, so not just creating a... Um, a brand of your art alone. I think it's quite important nowadays for the modern artist to also be part of that. So um, that people know who I am and want to support me is also quite a large part of my my brand of Mickey Co. really. And um, it's helped me immensely because without Patreon and, and these fans that just immediately, you know, like I, I could say, like even with the with the commissions recently, I, I would just mention like, oh, I can't go to conventions. I need to open commissions. And I had, I don't know, like 10 slots available. And they filled up within like two days, you know. Oh, cool. So you see and, people like respond to like the sort of what's going on with coronavirus and knowing that it affects or how it affects like freelance yeah. artists and like jump to the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen quite a lot of support on Twitter as well. Just like, you know, I just have have an eye on social media here and there if i if i have the time and i think i've seen quite quite a lot of artists being being um like enthusiastically supported especially now because everybody's stuck at home and you know and they're just grateful to have like entertainment through comics and art through us so yeah i think yeah. it's great yeah okay so like tell me a bit about your 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 process your writing or artwork process do you like, how do you put together your stories? Do you typically, like, work in specific blocks of time or do you find, like, your sort of stories come come and go uh, at different times during a day or during a week? Mm, yeah, it's a bit messy for me. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm I think... glad to hear uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, you know how it is. Creativity is incredibly unpredictable. So you really have to sort of take it when you get it. Um I think in my case, it depends on the project. So, so for example, the mini comics have kind of been on hold for a while now, just because I've been, I jump around projects quite a lot, but the mini comics are the only ones that aren't um, like a structured creation pro process, if that makes sense. So the mini comics I draw whenever I have free time, I have a good idea that sort of gets me excited to draw it. I have a list of ideas that, that I write down whenever something happens. I'm like, oh my God, you know, oh, my friend Alex did this stupid thing again. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. Let me write or that your down. Cat. Your cat features a <laughs> yeah, lot. yeah. Oh my God. Oh, she's done that. Oh God, that's a perfect <laughs> moment. Write it down. Um, but it, it really is very dependent on my mood. So that is like, I have the ideas. I have to just sit down and draw it from start to finish. The strips are very simple and very short. So I can manage one strip in a day without problems but I really need to be in the mood for it. So that's the one thing. <laughs> right. Um, so it's very spontaneous. So I have a, an idea written down and I just sort of storyboard it immediately and then go directly into inking and, and coloring. It's, it's pretty, um, yeah, spontaneous essentially. Okay. But all other projects, um, I spend quite a long time writing it. So the writing process is the longest one for me. So it can it can take up to, well, it depends. Like recently I, I drew a short story, which was, I don't know, 32 pages. And it took me, I don't know, maybe a week to write. So that was fast. That mm. was very fast. I was but, then, say that. but that was just because it's a really short story. And I, I felt really inspired. <laughs> but then... On the other hand, I have a couple of stories where I've been sitting on these stories for years and years and years and it just doesn't click. So it just it's just a matter of letting it stew until I'm satisfied with it. And then I'll I'll take it out of that, you know, that part and decide, OK, well, this is the oops, sorry. Well, this is the next one I'm going to draw. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's the difficult part. But generally, I would say that if I'm um, stuck on a deadline, so when I made uh, Crash and Burn with a publisher, with a deadline, it took me about a year to write before I presented it and then drew it in a year. And that was 156 pages. Okay, so that's a so, bit more of a structured process. But then it's dependent on, like you say, working with publisher and having those deadlines i guess yes i think i think a huge part of cutting down the time is whether or not you're feeling good about your creative process um yeah 
and um because for example with the publisher a lot of things i find i could have done better but because of time constraints i just pushed forward anyway even if it wasn't perfect while for my personal projects i'm much more inclined to sit around and figure out a way even if it takes me twice as much time to do it you know because i I wanted to look great right in the end i wanted to read well and but yeah so that's that's the longest part but once that's done it's fairly easy because sketching it inking it coloring it well if it's in color is is like really easy to me and that can be done fairly quickly i find okay um yeah well, it's so. <laughs> interested to hear about like the the different situations that you have to produce work for, and like because you are like writer and artist, so you're there. You know, you're doing all kind of all stages. And I was just wondering if there's any particular stage of the that process that you feel you're you're best at, or uh, and is there any stage that you feel like you still need to improve on? I guess as creatives, we always feel like we could do things better. But how would you? Uh, how would you judge that based on what you do? Mm, yeah, I think I think the writing process is the hardest for me always. I don't think that's ever changed. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think a, a large part of it is is just language itself because uh, I did grow up with multiple languages, so I don't really have a language that I'm perfect at. <laughs> so English, for example, is is actually my third language. Um, oh wow! So, okay, well. You're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've started writing in English just because I, well, being here in the UK, it, it helps me to be able to ask English speakers whether or not this flows well or, you know, yeah. and it obviously it's also the international language currently that I can use most to, you know, un- unless I decided to start learning Mandarin, I suppose. <laughs> but um, it's it's just the easiest that flows. German is too convoluted, too long. I can't really fit words into speech bubbles. <laughs> um, so there's like this insecurity, I think, because, you know, my Japanese is good, but not perfect. My German is good, but not perfect. My English is good, not but not perfect. So what do you do, right? You just <laughs> sort of, you, you try to teach yourself as best as you can and you try, you try to do your best as you can. But English it currently is yeah so I, I do everything in English now so but it makes me a bit insecure about whether or not it's a good story <laughs> sometimes right. you know yeah, that. But um, then, like you say you can you can get that check that's something there where the story itself is is like comes yeah. from you whatever the language is in and then in terms of like writing in English it's something you can kind of yeah. get checked and get that uh, different uh, opinion it- Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, opinions are also very important. So getting input and like having trusted people that can give you critique to to whatever you're doing is is also essential. And I just like it just happened to be easiest to do in English (laughs) because I noticed when I was still working on the German projects that a lot of times I couldn't share anything because most people didn't speak German. Right. So. Right. And, yeah, I've uh, had that experience. Um, just going to a, a French convention with English manga uh, and just quickly seeing people open and close books once they realise yeah. it's not in their native language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think France is quite notorious for that though, because they don't seem to like to speak English that much. <laughs> I I was told I was warned to be fair before I went, and I was like, no, it'll be it'll be okay. They'll they'll get it. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they didn't. But okay. Um, yeah. So, and then actually, what did you what do you think you're then best at if um, writing is oh, the one um, thing that? Yeah, I think I'm probably best at. Um, the storyboarding part so it's essentially the bit before sketching it nicely so (laughs) um (laughs) so just just the flow of the story once i have a story i think i'm very good at translating it into pages and panels that make sense and are very readable and are fun to read i think and um that's the part i'm also most proud of because um i've had a lot of fans tell me that when they just occasionally pick up the book a book whichever um and just flip it open at any page and and just look at it because they just wanted to flip through it a little bit they tend to get glued to the page and start reading the rest <laughs> and that is a great compliment a good sign. That, yeah. yeah exactly that they just sort of look at a page and just begin reading and just forget that they just were flipping through a couple of pages and yeah that's 
yeah <laughs> cool yeah no it's good to hear so like in all like the years you've been uh, working or actually before then did you have any kind of formal training in terms of writing stories or um sort of building up your skill as an artist or was this all self-taught uh it's it's actually all self-taught <laughs> really yes wow, i I, cool. I i applied to uh an art school once and i got rejected <laughs> seriously <laughs> yes yes um but it was a fine arts school i think and to be fair they just they in germany especially uh comics and manga are just considered the lowest art form in general by these people yeah, so i'm not i'm not too yeah i'm not too not too surprised that it happened but i remember doing it and being hopeful because i i didn't draw manga when i applied i drew realistic portraits and at the end of the day when i got rejected i was like you know what i should just i just i should just go online and just post my stuff there and not care what people tell me <laughs> that's a and good that response was, yeah and in the end that was exactly um what helped me get where i am so the internet is it has been essential so yeah. yeah and usually when people tell those kind of stories it ends with them going back to their teacher or the person that rejected them and showing like <laughs> this is where i am now did you do that or do you have plans to do that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really have contact to any of my teachers, but I did have one of them that told me it was a waste for me to, to, to <laughs> join manga. Like, I was wasting my talent drawing manga instead of fine art. I mean, I'm just looking back now, I'm just, that's just so ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it goes to show. Um, yeah. So, looking at the, the writing side of, um, of what you do, and <laughs> you've already talked about, I guess, some of your process where in terms of some stories like with your mini comics it's a bit sporadic and with something like uh, crash and burn you've got more of a i guess structured process like in either do you ever come across writer's block because uh, this is something that uh, i've talked or i've been asked about um in terms of like my writing process and if you do do you have any ways to get a like for you mm. yeah so um i've definitely experienced it before um like art block is definitely a thing or art block yeah yeah <laughs> um it's difficult to say what works best so um uh like m my worst art or slash writer's block was was um before like a couple of years ago um i i recently got diagnosed with bipolar disease uh, disorder and okay. um so before that i was not on medication and i did not know what was going on but i was depressed a lot and that was essentially the reason for me not being able to draw or work or create and so for me it was really seeking professional help and not being afraid of this mental illness like th that's been a huge change for me like accepting that I have this and working with it yeah and and it's it's changed my life since I went and got help um but I still had co like coping mechanisms I suppose beforehand that made it a little bit easier and I found that um changing pace was very important changing like going out which you can't do right now but doing no, something no, else <laughs> do not do not go out do not People go out <laughs> If you if you have a garden, just go out into yes. your garden <laughs> and just sit in the sun for a bit. You know, play with your pet, play some video games, watch a movie. Just do something else. If you're fed up with art or writing, do something else. I found that um, reading books, uh, watching movies, um, looking at the things that inspired you before helps. So I would read all my favorite manga again. That really got me excited to become a manga artist in the first place. And like that nostalgia really got got me inspired again to, to sort of sit back down and go, I can do this, you know. Um, sometimes it was an exchange with fans, but the difficulty with that is it can also have the opposite effect. So I would I would say be careful. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, it depends who you're talking to, really. Yes, yes. So like on the one hand, I think you can have amazing fan exchange where the, somebody writes you an email 
out of the blue and says, uh, I was in a really bad place and I read your comics and it made me laugh and it changed my life and I love everything you do. That That is the kind of stuff that you need to hear sometimes yeah. you know, when you're in a bad place yourself. Um, and then you have people who, who are really innocent. They don't know that what they're saying is maybe not the best thing. <laughs> And it's it's never it's never meant in a bad way. But sometimes you you get people who are like, when do we get more? Can I have more? I need more because I love. What yeah. <laughs> and and the enthusiasm is great, but it puts so much pressure on an artist, mm. you know, or a writer, I think. And so so I find that actually getting away from social media has been much better than looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good tip in in general. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it can help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I totally I, get that. Yeah, like that. I, I guess there's no real cure for it that works for everybody. So everybody's a bit different. So I think over the years I've just noticed what I, what I react to negatively versus positively, and I just decided to stick to the stuff that works. Yeah. Something you know that just calms me and sort of gets my mind off the frustration. Um, yeah. And uh, and sometimes it's it's just talking to people that you trust that you know have a good eye for things can give you the right advice at the right time, or just tell that they'll just tell you, listen, you can come with me now. We're gonna watch a movie, <laughs> you know. Yeah, just take you away from the the situation yeah, yeah. and just free your mind so, a bit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I get that, and <laughs> I, I hear you on sort of the getting the feedback from people who have read your work in in terms of sometimes people don't always appreciate like the amount of work that goes uh into it and when they say you know when's the next one in your mind you're thinking like that's a whole other like you just described sort of two years of yeah. writing it in our, our work so when if someone asks you like when's the next one you're like that's a whole two years i've got to go through uh, all these things so i can imagine <laughs> how that how that would make you feel yeah just let me have a break please <laughs> <laughs> oh um is i did have a, just a like a side note i remember at a recent convention where uh someone bought uh one of our our volumes and while he was waiting like he was with uh, i think he was with his partner so he was watching her stall and then towards the end of the convention he came back and said oh i love the i love the story i'm like wait you read it already it's been it kind of been two hours and like, yeah no i really loved it so in my mind i'm like oh man i've got a on that story <laughs> as well so to give this guy another hour of uh, of enjoyment but um yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, i wanted to like go back to your your first sort of comic uh, that you made and like seeing as you weren't you didn't go through the the formal training of uh, of developing your artwork and your uh, your stories what was it like making your first uh, graphic novel or comic and how does it compare to like your process now and your feeling about it now? Um, oh, it's it's kind of hard to say which one was my first one. I have like a very convoluted uh, career, <laughs> okay. so so it's a little bit difficult to pinpoint what exactly was my first. Um, so I think I think my very first, where I really sat down and just drew a lot of pages. <laughs> um, that ended up being a comic was so I I was commissioned by a friend to draw a fan fiction story and that was actually a really good start because I didn't know how to write stories <laughs> <laughs> and so having a fan fiction piece that I just had to translate into panels and pages was a really good exercise just to be able to to sort of have that 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 amount of pages done at the end and look at it and say okay I've made a comic you know so that that was then picked up by an indie publisher because it was a parody it was like okay to to print and sell as well yeah. um uh yeah so uh, what was the question again <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I just wanted to know about like the the process of making your first comic what that was like and how it compares to now yeah yeah so so I guess uh that that was just you know totally different because I hadn't I didn't really uh, collaborate with the author I did ask her for permission to do this which I got and she really enjoyed it as well but I I created the whole thing without input of any other parties so that was that was really interesting and then the next one I did was an official one for a publisher which was uh 
quite chaotic. <laughs> um, oh. So I didn't really know how to write a story, but I attempted to write one and then and then did the same thing. And it, it, it like technically it all worked fairly well. So I did have a vague deadline because it was, again, an indie publisher. They were a lot more lenient with, you know, deadlines and when to when to print things. And um, but they, they also gave me full artistic freedom to do whatever I wanted. And um, looking back now, I, I'm not I mean, it's one of those things that isn't really listed on my projects that I've completed necessarily just because. Oh, really? It's like it's hidden, <laughs> hidden away somewhere. Yeah, I think some people <laughs> still love it, but I look back and well, I you're see not one it, of them. I see a teenaged me writing this. However, I wasn't a teenager anymore. You know, you know this <laughs> yeah. kind of embarrassment you have for your teenage self. That's that. I still have a bit of that looking at that project. So yeah <laughs> that's really interesting I, I guess you you have that process of looking back at your work and going actually this isn't that good I don't want to see this anymore <laughs> and you just in, in a way it's a good thing because it shows you're progressing and you've you've learned more but yeah I can imagine that you look back and you just go why do people like this like do you ever have that feeling that you just want to ask people like why do you like this I do much better stuff now <laughs> <laughs> I I don't really like I, I know that a lot of people just have different preferences and the people who approach me about it are still genuine you know so I'm not gonna I try my best not to ruin it for them so I just go I'm just grateful that they love it and they support <laughs> it. some still ask like are you gonna draw more of that and I have to tell them I'm sorry but that's that's no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to anybody like some things I'm just not gonna pick back up um but yeah, in terms of process, I think the only thing that's really changed is that I've learned to do the th things better uh, over time. Um, I think I've always been incredibly serious about creating comics and being on time, especially. Yeah. Um, that I just did try my best to, to do it in a most structured way possible. And um, a lot of the times, like after the, the, the one I'm a bit embarrassed about... Which we after shall that, not name or, the or one talk that about after this. Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah exactly. The one that shall not be named. Um, everything after that is fine. Like, I'm perfectly happy with it, you know, um, because I think I, I finally got, like, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So the, the writing bit was the bit I struggled with most. Um, and I think that's why, like, looking at that particular project, I'm very keen on getting it right for everything in the future. <laughs> So I spent extra time on the writing. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you did a, a lot of learning on the job. Mm, yes. Uh, I guess which which comes with being self-taught. You just you put yourself in these positions to have to produce the work and have to understand how to produce the work and then eventually get better at it. Yeah, that's right. Like uh, Germany has a big market of um, what well, I don't know about now, but at the time there was a huge. Um, market for 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 locally created material so like german manga is a big thing um yeah. but the unfortunate part is the editors that were in the publishing houses were just not people like in japan who had years and years and years of experience of writing and creating manga that all they could do is read other manga and then read yours and go well it's not as good as that one or Oh, okay. I've seen a different manga do that. Can you do that? Right. So their knowledge is, well, limited because I like I grew up reading manga before everybody started reading manga. So I just never felt that my editors could really contribute a lot to what I was doing because they just hadn't read as many or seen as many or grown up with them yeah. to, to understand the deeper meaning of certain things that I did when I drew them. Um, that said, I still, you know, I still listen to their critique and change things if they wanted to, but it didn't happen very often. But I, I often wondered when I listened to my colleagues talk because, you know, they often had to change things. And I, I was really puzzled over some of the requested changes and I just wondered, <laughs> you know, like it would be very different if a Japanese editor were there because they are trained for this stuff, you know? Yeah. You get a lot of different feedback, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And a, a lot in manga is really um, based on the language as well, which is lost once it's translated. So um, 
uh, cultural st stuff as well is just kind of just glanced over because they're not sure what it means, right? Mm. And um, yeah, I found that a bit lacking in, in the German scene. And um, well, anyways, that's one of the reasons I ended up being independent eventually too. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point because I, I guess like in terms of uh, manga, it's something that has, it's, it's risen in prominence, if not necessarily mainstream like I'm just speaking here in the UK, there is definitely a big audience for it. Um, mm. And a lot of the work, whether it's manga or, or anime, is sort of influencing over here in the West as people become more familiar with it. Is it something that you've, have you noticed in terms of impact on people's work or people's ability to appreciate the, the work better versus the limited um, kind of understanding that they had uh, some time ago? Yeah, I think uh, it, everything's like it's been in, insane how much has changed, really. So growing up, I, I grew up, so I was born in, in Tokyo and then spent most of my time growing up all over the, the world. Um, and nobody knew what manga is. And when it came to like Japan, the most that people knew were like maybe sushi and samurais ninjas maybe? okay <laughs> the essentials of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> but manga well when somebody said manga or anime it was all hentai and nothing else like nobody really knew anything but oh isn't that the pervy cartoons that's yeah. all you, you heard and i think like it started to change around when i was like 15 maybe 16 people mentioned street fighter Maybe Legend of Zelda was a thing, slowly. A Sailor Moon started out around that time in Germany as well. And then now that generation grew up with it and learned to love it. They they know so much about Japan. Like, <laughs> it's completely different. And um, and I don't know, I think it's it's wonderful. Like, I, I don't feel so weird anymore because when, when I was in school, I got like a lot of weird racist things said to me just because I'm half Japanese um, and it doesn't happen anymore. Like nowadays, that's just not a thing. So okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like it's, it's great to share cultural stuff and I think it should happen more for other things too, not just manga. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's the, the benefit of having that just cross, what's that cross cultural pollination mm. i don't know you know what i mean there's like yeah, things yeah. going into other cultures where then people gain an understanding deeper than just the the stereotypes that they've heard yeah, somewhere yeah. else like you said like the sushi samurais and uh, <laughs> hentai um but yeah no so that's, <laughs> that's good at least some progress is is being made yeah. um so obviously we, we spoke um about your your comments but I, I noticed that a lot of your work sort of goes beyond comics and you uh, so you've done some like presenting and uh, live streaming and working in uh, video games as well. Mm -hmm. Is this something that like are these things that you plan to do? You always wanted to do, or is that just something that's come up organically through just making your comics and being known for that? Uh, yeah, it's kind of um, it. It was it started out as a necessity. So when I uh, started drawing just manga and comics in general and posting it online I I was still working you know part-time and trying to make ends meet and I just noticed that game art paid better than comic art <laughs> which is funny okay. because you know game devs complain that they're not paid enough but oh, yeah. <laughs> compared to comics and manga uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually good pay anyway um so I so my goal was to just um, tap that market as well, just in case. So with commissions and like you know working on projects, and and then I also dated somebody who was in working in that field mm. for a while. And during that time, I just got a really good insight into how they work. So I just uh, created more that catered to that industry as well. And then I got a couple of smaller jobs in with indie creators or uh, indie devs or you know, little bits and bobs here and there. And most of it didn't take off. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. so that's that's kind of how it how it ended up. I just kept it in my um, in my CV anyway, because a lot of video games are in that aesthetic anyway. So yeah. why not? Right. And um, Makes sense. yeah, and 
eventually I, I, I did draw a couple of cover pieces for Nintendo, which was pretty cool. So <laughs> Yeah. How did that come about? Um I I'm not entirely sure, but I think <laughs> uh I just got messaged by their agency one day and they just went like, Well, we're looking for somebody who draws in that style and uh okay. we really like your stuff. And I so think it came to you. Yeah, I think they might have talked to somebody at the my publishing house at the time and they just sent a list of artists maybe and I was the only one who drew digital art so that was right. why I got the job. Yeah. Because that's uh, really cool. Yeah. German right. artists are all like for the majority they they do work traditionally still because they're they're very fond of the traditional uh manga look and they they haven't quite let go of that yet. I think they're slowly transitioning towards digital too. But like, <laughs> I I was one of the first to just do a hundred percent digital. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. And let me just say, as because uh, we do a, a video game event and Nintendo has supported us, but uh, mm -hmm. I always have this struggle, this ongoing struggle, to get them to even respond to an email. So oh. the fact that you had them come to you just like is amazing to me just <laughs> just that alone i mean like working like doing artwork for nintendo is, is fantastic but uh weirdly enough the thing i'm like most impressed by is the fact that you got them to respond to you because uh i'm still struggling with that uh yeah. anyway that's just like a <laughs> uh, personal experience is uh, coming out there but um all right so we're gonna i wanted to get your like tip for storytellers um on the show <laughs> We like to sort of talk about stories and and give tips. So I tend to like give things that I'm working on or or things that I've sort of experienced recently. The uh, great thing about having a uh, a guest who creates stories is I don't have to do that. I can ask <laughs> you. So um, yeah. So if you have like a storytelling tip you can give to aspiring um, artists, what would it be? Yeah, so I think I've thought about this because I was like, oh, surely everybody's given all the tips already. But uh, when it comes to manga or comics, I find that one thing that most people struggle with is what do I put into panels and why? And mm. so uh, it's really hard to explain just quickly in a podcast. So my tip would be to watch good movies and look at them frame by frame um so by doing that so um an example uh the the art i forgot his name i'm sorry naruto's artist used to teach himself how to draw manga by doing exactly that he would take his favorite i think it was tarantino films yeah and then pause every frame and draw it and the wow. the reason he did this is because the pacing of a comic slash manga is much closer to a film or movie slash tv show anything visual than it is to writing so um don't like don't try to practice by making like books or text into comics but practice by translating visuals of a film to comic that would be my tip um yeah, because because like the the comic medium or manga medium is much closer to film than it is to to like books, even though yeah. it's printed in books. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. It's 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 visual. So you're you're now looking to other visual mediums to kind of get a sense of how you can uh, craft your own story. Exactly. So like if you understand the pacing of a film, then you will also have a better understanding of a pacing in a comic and how to set it up as well. And um, um, uh, the rest of it is really understanding how paneling works. So that's like the next step up is once you know or you've, you've seen like frame by frame, the next part is how do I split it on a page, right? So, so what you do is you, you freeze moments in time into panels and then the, the mind fills the blanks. Sure. So, so that's like... I feel like I could talk for three hours just about yeah. that, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe maybe just maybe for next time. Then I could yeah. get into that next time. <laughs> That's cool. No, it's a, it's interesting that you uh, you bring that up because even like for myself, from a writer's perspective, I've also looked to film uh, and screenwriting as a way to understand like how to tell a story in comics. And even though I don't 
uh, do the artwork uh, for our books, just working with an artist and understanding that ultimately people are going to sort of, their first contact is visual uh, with your story, just understanding how to put that together from that perspective. So yeah, it's interesting to sort of, uh, it's a good point to bring up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really like, I'm very grateful when I'm approached by a writer who does screenplay because that's exactly yeah. what I need and a lot of times I get I get like young people who message me and say oh I've got the story and I need an artist and I just I have to tell them like you have to write screenplays not mm. not a book like a book like that's like 90 percent of the work is done by the artist in that case if you have a screenplay it splits it up much better in terms of how much work each of the like the partnership is doing yeah and uh and you also yeah it's I've I've worked with um, a, a screenwriter before and it's just so pleasant to work with <laughs> because, because of this because like you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah Great no, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> okay so yeah learn screenwriting and uh, studying the the frames of uh, of films to understand how to be make better stories exactly yeah cool that's <laughs> a good good tip. Um, so yeah, we are uh, coming towards the end of our interview, but uh, we just wanted to make sure that we shout out your projects that you want people to know about or anything that is coming up uh, that people can sort of direct themselves to. Um, yeah, so I think best is just to check out my website, which is just mikiko.art uh yeah it's just m-i-k-i-k-o dot art um and everything about me you can find there so so you can find my free comics to read the link there my sh shop which is closed <laughs> um my portfolio my um all my social media accounts uh everything is linked on mikiko dot art and um as for future projects i will be updating on my social media if something comes out um like patreon may mostly gets the first uh, announcements um and i am currently because of the situation now <laughs> working on commissions yeah. and not so much on projects but um the two projects mini comics and crash and burn are still ongoing except that there is no real timeline yet my plan for now is to bring out mini comics volume two soon ish probably next year sometime um, just because I've collected quite a lot of strips by now and I'm trying to fill the rest so that I have enough for another book. Uh, yeah, cool. so that's that's probably it for now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll make sure we get those links in the show notes so people know where to find you. Excellent, thanks. Cool. Well, yeah, it's uh, we've come to the end of the, of the interview. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Cool. All right, I'm glad. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, this episode will be available, like I said at the top, at everywhere where you get your podcasts from. I'm pretty sure um, it's available on all the platforms. So Apple, Spotify, uh, you can also support us on Patreon to get episodes 24 hours early. And although I didn't speak much about uh, our work, uh, we, my Mada, also make manga. So you can find our uh, manga online. And uh, just a shout out for our next episode of Story X Story, which will be uh, an EGX Res coronavirus special in that there was no EGX Res because of coronavirus. Um, but we are going to have a bunch of guests on to talk about some of the video games that we're playing and video game news uh, that we're excited about, all from the safety of our own homes. So yeah, don't leave your house. Um, so yeah, so our email address is feedback at myamada.com. You can send us your feedback on anything we've discussed today. The website is also myamada.com slash story x story. Uh, stay tuned until next time. Bye. Bye. -bye.